So yeah, we're about to start the last but not least section of today's symposium, extraaxial brain tumors. Our first talk will be uh, by Phil Tiosodopoulos, who is a professor and vice chair of our department, as well as chief and uh, director of the skull-based tumor program at the BTC. And his presentation is entitled Surgical Management of Meningiomas and Other Skull-Based Tumors. Phil? Perfect. Well, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you virtually. This uh, pandemic has brought us all closer together, although it kept us also far apart. Uh, I will talk about uh, meningiomas and other skull-based tumors. This is obviously a talk that could take hours and days to, to talk about, but I will just hit some important developments over the past few years. I don't really have any disclosures that relate to this, but what I think uh, has become obvious in skull-based surgery, which is really the more complex brain surgery, is that along three different paths, there has been evolution over the past decade. The first one being new technologies and surgical approaches. The second one being different way of thinking about certain uh, tumors. And the third one being actually for the very first time in a long time, uh, medical treatments and better understanding, molecular understanding and genetic understanding of these conditions. We should start by saying it all is based on anatomy and a lot of us who do this kind of work spend a lot of time in the lab doing anatomy and doing courses with folks and learning constantly. And then we take all of this and we translate it into the surgical field, into the operating room. And let's just start with meningiomas because they are the most common intracranial brain tumors. Um, this is the beginning of what we would call minimally invasive brain surgery started a few years ago, and this is a small meningioma of the tuberculum with visual loss because it's involving the optic, uh, the optic canal. And of course, it wouldn't be a complete lecture without some surgery for all of you to see, but I will advance it because I think we are a little behind. This is along the base of the skull. This is coming through the nose and getting to the base of the tumor and then not really making a craniotomy from the top. This is all through the nose. There's no cutting the skin anywhere. And this is the top of the sphenoid sounds. What you're seeing here is where the cella is, is right back down here. And this is above the cella. And we're removing this meningioma microsurgically through an endoscope. So what you're seeing, the view that you're seeing is the view that I was seeing when I was taking this out. And as you see at the very end, we're able to remove this with sharp dissection and eventually get a picture that gets us to the optic nerve right here being decompressed completely and all the tumor have been, been removed and then we're reconstructed. So all of a sudden now we can, this is the reconstruction with a big of fat, the bit of fat in the area to seal the space. So all of a sudden now we're operating through the nose and going straight into the brain, taking a tumor out and, and sealing it all back. But even traditional cranial surgery didn't say the same. We're now using this much smaller both incisions, like an eyebrow incision and openings into the skull. And the opening here, as you see, it's about two centimeters or so, an opening right over here, over the eyebrow to take this kind of tumor, similar like before, out. And let's just spread the gears cow sharply again. We dissect the tumor away from the optic nerves, which are right over here. This is the optic chiasm. This is the optic nerve. This is the carotid artery right down here. And by the end, you see the optic nerve completely decompressed. And now we're drilling with this drill, the canal where the optic nerve goes in to, to, to remove the rest of the tumor. And at the end, you have a complete resection. And cosmetically, this is the incision. You can barely see it in an eyebrow and you spare any other incisions or a big craniotomy. Finally, when we um, operate along the skull base, often localization is very important, but not so much localization of where we are because that is fairly obvious. The osseous skull base doesn't move like the brain moves. However, being able to understand how much of a tumor we've taken out is very important. And this is a, a, a accelerated video just for the sake of um, showing you, but this is removing an acoustic neuroma. This is the brainstem dissecting it away from the brainstem. And what's important here is here is the facial nerve being stimulated. We're pulling the tumor away. And to be able to understand how much tumor stays behind stuck on the facial nerve as the new uh, ways that we operate on this tumor require to leave some tumor behind to not hurt the nerves. 
We use now uh, interoperative guidance and navigation. This is a good example of that, a, a case of an older woman who has had a tumor that despite initially wanting to follow it grew significantly. And as you see on the first top image, we leave a tiny little rind of tumor, but to, to be able to do that, we use interoperative navigation where we actually we can tell while we're in there, how much tumor we take away. You see how this orange outline, I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer that works here, but the orange outline becomes less and less and smaller and smaller as we take more and more tumor so that we can figure out how much tumor is safe to take. So those are some of the adjuncts or technical advances that we've had over the past 10 years and it has really revolutionized skull-based surgery. But then we also had a very uh, significant change in our understanding of, of how we treat these tumors, most of them being benign, not all of them. So when we look at craniopharyngiomas, craniopharyngiomas now endoscopy and minimally invasive surgery has recalibrated on our entire approach. And this is a schematic that I use in our thinking of how we operate on this. But when we see a big cella that these tumors expand from the cella out, <clears throat> then pretty much most of them are done endoscopically. And even if it's not an expanded cella, now we do most of this endoscopically. These are tumors that 10 years ago, we did all through a craniotomy, no use of endoscopy whatsoever. And now this entire uh, algorithm has turned on its, on its head. This is a good example, a 38 year old with visual loss and this tumor in the supercellar space without widening of the cella. And at the end of the endoscopic resection, this is the view you get the basilar artery, the quadrifurcation of the basilar artery, the third nerve, the optic nerves up here, and the entire tumor is gone. All the perforators into the optic chiasm are, are, are maintained. And this kind of view you only can get with endoscopy. But we also have understood a little bit better multiple other tumors, including tuberculum tumors, which are a very common meningioma variety. And this is some work that we have done here in terms of trying to understand what is the actual goal of resection. We have gone over, I would posit that we've gone away from the gross total resection is the end all be all to trying to understand what pieces of tumor are safe to take or are safe to leave behind with respect to progression of the tumor. And what we have done here is a, this study was a combination of us and Paolo Capabianca's group in Naples uh, where we combined endoscopic there, another pioneering group of treating tumors, uh, meningiomas along the skull base. And we tried to see what is the better way of doing this and to find out some conclusions based on data as to how do we recommend endoscopic approaches, microscopic approaches, leaving remnants behind. And as you can see here, these are the lessons that we learned and, and, and the correlations that we made, meaning that midline lesions, lesions that don't go lateral to the optic nerves, and smaller lesions that don't encase vessels are the ones to do the endoscopic approaches in. A word about malignancies along the skull base, and I put this slide up because the bottom panel is the, the first uh, world conference on, on uh, endoscopy, where using endoscopy for malignancies was anathema. And then in Vienna in 2012, I was giving the plenary talk on on endoscopic management of malignancies. And now today it is pretty much standard of care. How all of this had expanded our understanding and of, of how we treat these tumors effectively and also minimize the morbidity for patients. And here is a good example of this, a tumor in anterior skull-based malignancy that extends into the brain. And all of a sudden now we're not using this big disfiguring facial incisions that we used to use for a very long time. And as you can see, this is a combined approach from the top through craniotomy. I'm working from the top and my colleague from ENT is working from below with an endoscope. And you see we reconstruct the skull base. We took the entire tumor out and reconstruct the skull base and how we can both work at the same time on the same patient and really be safe and a lot more efficient and effective. And so this is a busy slide, but to mostly say that it has really redefined really significantly the indications for big disfiguring surgeries. And along the skull base, it is the dictum that we create a lot more harm in the approach uh, often because it, these are difficult places for us to get to. And this is the way, this is the way forward to try to minimize that. Finally, talking about acoustic neomas, and probably that has been the biggest redefinition of what we do. A big acoustic neoma here in a young person with this balance trouble and taking it all out is always 
preferable. However, that's not always possible. And when you look at these tumors, eventually they get to be stuck. You see here the facial nerve going outwards and the remnant of the tumor. And as you see the facial nerve and the brainstem, uh, the facial nerve can become very adherent to the uh, capsule of the tumor. We need to leave some tumor behind. And what happens then? So redefining that entire idea that gross total resection of these mostly benign slow growing tumors, redefining that entire algorithm was a very important step that happened over the past 15 years. Here's a good example of a big tumor that was taken out back um, many years ago in, in, in 97. The tumor was all taken out. And you see that several years ago in panel three, the tumor is regrowing. You know, now we understand that even gross total resected tumors can regrow, even if they are quote unquote benign. And then we treat with radio surgery. So this is the whole idea that facial nerve preservation, the functional preservation surgery took hold in skull based surgery. That was probably together with endoscopy, the biggest redefining factor of how we do acoustic neuroma surgery. And these are the, the giants in the field, including um, Majid Sami and the outcomes that they used to have in the era, even recently, of trying to take all the tumor out. And then these are the, these are the studies that we have done. And on the left up top is the first prospective multi-center randomized trial of taking, of leaving tumor remnants behind. And what we found was that this was much, this led to a much more improved facial nerve outcome. And as you see, the NTR stands for near total resection, meaning the least amount of tumor, as you see on the right top panel there, the big tumor and only a little rind of tumor left behind on the right. And the same thing with our entire experience here at UCSF, putting all of our data together, even outside the trial, big tumors, that patients do better with near total resections. This was a whole different redefinition of the acoustic neuroma algorithm. Of course, that is not as easy as one thinks because we can leave some tumor behind like this patient. You see the pre-op and the post-op is a tiny little remnant, but that post-op then remnant keeps on growing and then has to be treated with both surgery and radiation. So the question became, okay, we can redefine the risk up front of surgery, but what are the unintended consequences of that? And we found out that yes, some tumors will grow and then really focused on what are the predictors of that. Now, before I tell you a little bit of what we found up to now, what happens when they grow? Well, then we use stereotactic radio surgery. And initially, when we started leaving some remnants behind, most of us thought that we will treat these only and if they grow. And nowadays, I would tell you that most of us who do this a lot, treat these remnants up front because there's a small percentage, about one in five patients who will grow significantly during the time that you're observing them. And when you see this, in the long term, our data and everybody else's from Mayo Clinic and elsewhere show that the control rate for radio surgery following near total resections and subtotal resections of acoustic neuromas uh, confers a very good control rate of the tumor. Now, what we also found is that not all tumors that are radiated will respond. And this was a study that we have done a few years ago to where we, we looked at all of our tumors that were radiated. And we see that some of these tumors initially swell after the radiation and then eventually come back down. And we really find even the idea of when do you decide to retreat after radio surgery if you feel that there is failure and pushed out that envelope to almost five years from radiation. As you can see on the bottom right panel there, that there is an increase in the size, the pseudo progression of a tumor that has been radiated before it goes back down. And in that sense, really understood a lot better what the combined effect of microsurgery and radiation, radio surgery to follow causes on the tumor. So this again is another busy slide, but this is how we have redefined the entire treatment of acoustic neuromas with basically, other than the small asymptomatic tumors that we choose to follow, the symptomatic tumors eventually all ending up either in hearing preservation or facial nerve preservation. And that trumps the complete resection that we used to have. Finally, and, and quite likely the most exciting thing for uh, me and for all of us who, do, who, who live in the world of skull base is really what we have understood, not so much only with our hands and technically, but molecularly. And when you look at this, this probably started with the, the, this overall concept of treat, treating uh, neurofibromatosis type 2 related acoustic neuromas with bevacizumab, the paper that came out from, um, 
from uh, Harvard back at the New England Journal many years ago now, almost 20. Uh, and then, of course, a whole host of small molecule inhibitors that, that have been tried for sporadic and NF2-related acoustic neuromas with some uh, response. The idea that PDL1 is also involved, in the local inflammatory and the immune response is involved with growth of these tumors, especially in the post radiation uh, setting. This is data, early data out of Mayo that showed that. Recently, uh, Dr. Ali, who's going to be speaking to you later, I'll show you a few of the studies that we have done here because it's exciting. See, this is how um, Schwann cells would mature, and the NF2 loss will cause schwannomas. Well, then, which then can become more malignant or aggressive tumors, either immune uh, enriched or truly malignant peripheral nerve system tumors. And of course, the NF1 loss that leads to neurofibromas, which are a lot less common. And as you see examples of these on the right side, most of these are very, very difficult to treat tumors, uh, including large acoustic neuromas with significant displacement of the brainstem or bilateral acoustic neuromas or really huge tumors. And some of them are even from the periphery this uh, malignant uh, transformation that they can have. Uh, so in understanding this and understanding, and I'll show you a little bit more of this, understanding what are the real molecular pathways that get switched on to cause these otherwise benign behaving tumors to become a lot more aggressive. Now, when you look at meningiomas, what have we learned? Well, this is the most recent, the 2016 most recent WHO classification. The majority of them are grade one. Then we have the grade two, the atypical ones, the clear cell and cordoid ones, which have you know, specific pathologic criteria. And then of course we have the anaplastic ones, which are really cancers effectively, and they can spread in other parts of the body. A good way of thinking of how we treat this, well, at diagnosis, wait and see, certainly if they are smaller and they're not causing symptoms, if they are starting to grow surgery and radiation, usually on the surgery side. And of course, depending on what grade they are, discussing adjuvant treatment, discussing adjuvant radiation, as well as potentially uh, medical treatment. And, and really for a long time, we've, we've looked for that magic bullet of medical treatment for meningiomas, however, this, it's probably where it started all back in 2013, the idea that, as you see there, how many of these grade one and grade two and then grade three tumors have the NF2 mutation, which is pretty much ubiquitous across most acoustics and most meningiomas, but also mutations in smoothened and AKT, AKT1. And this led to this trial that I think Nancy Ann will talk a little bit more about about it later. And these are really difficult cases. You can see on the right hand side there, one of my patients, you can't even count how many uh, craniotomies this patient has had, trying to really keep them alive and keep them functioning. So we do need uh, better uh, medical treatments for this. When you look at the genetics of meningiomas though, that there is very specific uh, um, signatures that, that can correlate with with what um, behavior they would have. This is just a few examples of these genes that have been found with respect to grade one versus grade two and grade three meningiomas. And more importantly, where these are, now we know that convexity meningiomas have very specific genes that are uh, altered. Skull-based meningiomas, which are often the more benign ones, the slower growing ones, have a whole different set of these mutations, and of course, the more, much more rare spinal cord meningiomas have that. Why is that important? Well, all of these pathways that are involved obviously have specific blockers. And if one were to really think about this um, in, in an organized fashion, so as to create new trials, this is where the, our interest is to try to, to be creative in how we can um, start understanding how we can treat these tumors with molecular therapies. Um, PDL1 also very important in, in meningioma. And we know that grade three tumors have a higher uh, expression of that. This seems to be the immune response, the immune environment of the tumor seems to continue on being uh, important. I'm doing Dr. Rowley's um, advertisement here because this is another paper that uh, his lab put out with respect to meningiomas epigenetically and um, studied. And, and just I'll point only to one point in this uh, busy slide is that FOXM1 
the third panel from the left on the bottom, you can see that it is the low versus high uh, expression of that is more predictive than than grade is for for uh, overall survival. So there's no question that meningiomas have a very specific genetic um, pathways that 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 cause them to to become more malignant. This is another study that we did with Dr. Ali where uh, we tried to figure out which genes are to find basically a gene expression uh, algorithm of which tumor will recur and 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 be difficult to treat and as you can see they do correlate and when we looked at this in terms of of the uh, genetic score of these 30 some genes the gene score as you see on the left bottom panel the gene score actually predicts overall survival and progression free survival better than grade predicts survival. So there's no question that something is, um, that this is the way to, to um, proceed in the treatment. And again, another one of these um, um, papers that we've done, studies that we've done of how we can really cluster these um, more benign meningiomas versus the more aggressive meningiomas. And as you can see, they, they are different entities. Uh, you know, meningiomas for a very long time, we thought that it was just a very big catch-all for all of these tumors, but certainly there is very different uh, phenotypes that these uh, different, genetically different tumors have. And finally, I would say the last bit uh, in, the in the molecular aspect of this is for craniopharyngiomas, which was another very difficult disease to treat and another disease that never really had any molecular um, uh, and medical treatments. This recent paper from Nature Genetics that showed that craniopharyngiomas come in two forms. Most of them are the adamantinomous one, but there is a good subgroup of the papillary ones. And the papillary ones all have the um, BRAF V600E mutation, and, and only those do. So that opens up that whole gate of being able to treat with, with um, medical treatment craniopharyngiomas, which up to now we had to treat with surgery and radiation. Um, and often at recurrence, which they do recur again and again, uh, those were our only uh, tools. So in conclusion, this was a really whirlwind tour of, of what we've seen over the past um, several years, the evolution of the surgical technique with minimally invasive surgery. Now we're trying to really focus on minimizing the morbidity of what we do in taking out these very difficult tumors to tailor the approach to the individual pathology. Of course, Endoscopy, small approaches, et cetera, are safe and effective, but they, they do have a, a learning curve that is very important for all of us to, to be committed to. All uh, the, 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 the hybrid treatment concept is a very significant concept now for almost all of skull based lesions, almost all benign ones, and certainly even malignant ones. And finally, where the real money will be, the molecular and epigenetic correlates for the therapy and prognosis, which we're really working um, to understand and to study so that we can make some strides for our patients uh, with this really tough to treat uh, diseases. Again, this is work from a lot of people. Some of them are listed here, some of them are not. Um, and, uh, and I really would want to thank you all for your attention. Mm -hmm.